excited to get back here on a Monday night. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you all about um, some of my research and what's going on with some of my research related to viruses and COVID. Okay, so let's see if my mouse does work now. Yes, it does. Good. Okay, so you guys are all living in this pandemic. So I'm sure you guys have all heard about the coronavirus. I mean, my five-year-old daughter knows about the coronavirus. It's so funny to hear her say the word coronavirus. Um, but just to tell you a little bit more about what the virus is, um, you know, it's a single-stranded RNA virus. So you can see the RNA here in yellow on the inside. It's encapsulated by these capsid proteins. So it forms like a little shell around the nucleic acid. And the reason why it's called coronavirus is because corona is Latin for crown. So when you actually look at the side profile of the virus, it looks like it has, it's wearing a crown, right? So you have these pointy, pointy sides, and that, um, are, those are actually the spike proteins. So those spike proteins of the virus here are um, what is actually sensed by the ACE2 receptor of your cells, okay? So, single stranded RNA virus is one of the largest RNA viruses that are that's out there. It's about thirty thousand bases, um, and you know some of the common um, coronaviruses out there are the ones that are responsible for the common cold. So there's four different ones that are responsible for the common cold, um, but it's also um, responsible for some more dangerous viruses, such as the first SARS, right, that came out in two thousand and three in Hong Kong. And uh, also then, it's responsible for MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which came out in 2012 in camels in the Middle East. And so, coronaviruses have been around for a while, um, and this recent one we call SARS-CoV-2, came out in December in 2019, um, and it causes the disease, so known as coronavirus, oh, sorry, COVID-19. So the virus itself is called SARS-CoV-2, and it causes a disease which is called COVID-19. So it's similar to AIDS and HIV, right? So HIV is a virus, AIDS is the disease that the virus causes. So you can see here, um, there's been a lot, and um, maybe you guys have heard some of these speakers, but Mark Young here, he's a uh, virologist that's been here for many years. Um, he here has done what's called a transmission electron microscope. So here you see, um, you, shine, you, you basically shoot electrons at your tiny, tiny viruses. This is probably, I would say, coronavirus is probably like 100 nanometers in diameter, approximately that. And you can see here, if you look carefully, you can see the little spike proteins there. So that is, that's why it's called coronavirus, because there's a little the crown on its faces. Okay, and many of you guys may not know, but we are growing the virus right here on our campus. So in a very safe, <laughs> area. Um, this is the BSL-3 facility, and um, I think you might all be freshmen, is that right? Yeah? Okay, so have you been to Granny's Donuts? Yes? Okay, if not, you have to go there. It's my favorite donut shop. It has delicious, delicious donuts. Um, so if you look, the Granny's is probably somewhere right there, and if you go pa past the field house, um, down this road, past Granny's, that's where the BSL-3 air is, just past 19th and on 7th. And so it's this very secure facility. Um, you actually need FBI clearance to go inside and work in there. So there's, you know, more select, more dangerous select agents are in there. This is an emerging virus that we, you know, we're still discovering a lot about, and so that's also, you know, placed in BSL-3. It's considered fairly dangerous. And as you can see here, you, do not, you need a lot of uh, personal protective equipment to be able to work with the virus. So you're like suited up. There's actually four different levels of biosafety, right? So my lab deals with biosafety level one and two in my laboratory. So we work with, say, Pseudomonas, which is BSL-2. BSL-3 is like this type of facility. And BSL-4 is like maybe what you would see in the movie Contagion, where you're head to toe completely you know, completely protected and you're like showered before you go in and showered when you come out. And so we do have one of those um, in Hamilton, Montana, which is pretty close to here, close to Missoula. So there's an NIH um, BSL facility there. So we've been growing up, so me and a few other lads um, have been growing up the 
virus in there. So this is actually the host cell for the SARS-CoV-2. It's called Vero. They have these Vero cells. It's actually a African green monkey fibroblast cell line. And a lot of virologists use it because all sorts of viruses will grow in these cells, like um, rotavirus, influenza, polio. Um, it just pretty much propagates anything. It's not the most realistic cell line because it doesn't produce what's called interferon. So your body naturally has this um, immune response and makes interferon to prevent viral infection. And these cells don't do that, so they're not so realistic, but they're great at propagating. So here you can see the Vero cells here, um, right here, and you can see those are those are um, these are actually uh, infected cells, and you can see this cytopathic effect. And get his master, um, where you know these these uh, white, dense, small round cells. That's where the virus has have come on and infected, um, infected these uh, cells. So uninfected ones look like this, and you can see a lot more of these white specks in the Vero cells. So we have this virus growing really well in this very safe con contained um, area, um, and and most virologists, and actually it's quite amazing that we have this VSL-free facility. Not a lot of universities have them. So my virus collaborator at UIDC at this large research university, he doesn't have a VSL-free, so he's not able to actually work on the live virus. But it's actually a huge advantage because we can, we can work with the live virus and we can actually um, measure how infectious it is, right? So what we can do is there's virologists use two different means of measuring how infectious a virus is. The first one is a plaque. So if you hear virologists talking about plaques, this is what they look like. So what you do is you grow up the cells in a six well plate and you dilute the virus down. And you start to count these um, areas where they're like white spots. And every time you see a white spot, that comes from one infectious virus particle that then infects neighboring cells around it and then it doesn't propagate further because it's in this like tight mesh where it can't move. So you have the number of plaques, and that tells you the concentration of virus you have, and, and that also tells you how, how infectious your solution is, right? So if I wanted to go in there and take your saliva sample and say, okay, well, how many infectious variants do I have in here? I can do a plaque assay on your saliva. The other, way, the other thing virologists do is this endpoint titration assay, which is usually a lot faster, and they look, it's very similar. They look to see, you know, those brown cells that are light, they look to see when 50% of those cells in each one of those wells are mice. And so these two numbers, these two assays usually correlate really well, and this is how you measure how infectious your virus is. Now you can also visualize, um, and this is just a beautiful image that I love. This comes from um, Dr. Matt Taylor, also, um, he's a herpes virologist here on campus. And, um, but you know, when SARS hit, um, or when uh, COVID hit, we switched over to this virus. And so what you see here is you can see these cells, and it's called immunofluorescence detection, where you have these antibodies. The antibodies are green, and they basically attach onto the nucleocapsid protein, so the outside shell that I told you about, of the virus, and then basically you can see if the cells infect or not. So the really green cells here have a lot of virus. And then you can maybe see around there, these are cells. Um, the blue is the nucleus. So here is a, is a cell with a blue nucleus, but it's not as green, right? So that's not as effective. So it's just this beautiful image. You can actually see um, viruses um, accumulating within these uh, cells. Okay, <laughs> so that's the virus. Now how do you actually test if you're, the virus is in your body? So typically, you would do what's called the CDC assay, and you go to get tested, and this is what happens when you get tested. Let's hope this video works.
patient blow her nose into a tissue to clear excess secretions from the nasal passages. Tilt the patient's head back slightly so that the nasal passages become more accessible. Instruct the patient to close her eyes to lessen the mild discomfort of the procedure. Gently insert the swab along the nasal septum just above the floor of the nasal passage to the nasal pharynx until resistance is felt. Rotate the swab gently against the nasopharyngeal mucosa for 10 to 15 seconds. Gently remove the swab and place it into its container. Yes. So, how many of you guys have got this done? <laughs> yeah. I've heard it's not so pleasant, and they have people at both nostrils, right? So, okay. Anyway, um, maybe it's a little bit like a, a brain tickle is what I heard it's like. Um, so, not the most pleasant, but that's the typical test because there's so much virus kind of in your nasal pharyngeal um, area. And so, you need to swap, right? So, it's something that you need. And, you know, in the, in the beginning of the pandemic, you're just running out of all this PPE and running out of swabs. And so, I just wanted to say here that Jim Wilking in my department in chemical and biological engineering has been 3D printing swabs, which you can do through a Formlabs 3D printer. Um, and also Formlabs worked with the, uh, the USF Hospital, Norfolk Hospital back in March to you know, 3D print all of these different, um, many, many of these, of, of these swabs because we were running out. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of swab research as well. And, and so this university up here, University of uh, Wolverhampton, has been making ones that make it more comfortable you know, to, um, to, to test somebody. So you have a you have your swab. Now you also need a trained personnel to put that swab all the way back to shove it all the way back to the back of your head. And so that's another thing is that you know this trained personnel has to be completely covered in PPE to make sure none of the you know sneezing and coughing that happens when this test is administered happens. And so, so then you notice you put the swab into the media, and this is the media that you put it into. It's called viral transport media. We can actually make it in the lab. It's really a, just a simple recipe. I think I feel like a lot of these things are just so simple for us, for, for um, just anyone who does biology in the laboratory. But anyway, it's um, it's a simple mixture of here you can see of uh, just some nutrients that. Um, you know, keep the virus stable, and also some, you know, uh, gentamicin, which is an antibiotic, an antifungal agent is in there. And uh, here you can see uh, Ryan Langlois lab. He also works on influenza. He has made all of these tubes and, and has them well refrigerated with three mils of viral transport media for his local testing site. So now what? So now you actually have to figure out um, if, if the virus is in the viral transport media. So we do what's called the standard, the gold standard test, which is the RT-KTPR test. So RT stands for reverse transcription. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then when you hear about, you know, PTCR, this is what you're hearing about in the news. So you take a sample. Um, the first thing you have to do is, remember I said the virus is encapsulated, right? So you have to access the RNA inside. Somehow get rid of the captain. So usually what we do to do that in the laboratory, we call that RNA extraction, and we use this viral RNA extraction kit, which consists of a tube, and then you do a series of wash sets, and then you get the final purified viral RNA here. Um, so, then, wait, so then you do this, it takes about an hour, you know, all these like centrifugation steps. Um, you can also use magnets, which make it a little bit more high throughput. And then what you do is you take that purified viral RNA, and you put it into a 96 well plate together with your mix, your, your PCCR mix, which is just a bunch of primers and you know an uh, enzyme that amplifies or well that turns the RNA into DNA, which is that first step here. It's called reverse transcription. So it takes a single-stranded RNA, turns it into double-stranded DNA, and then it just amplifies through PCR. And this, this does, you do it through this machine, this PCCR machine here, and um, it takes about two hours to do this. So, quite some time. And then you look at your, you read your results. And so I know it's really hard to see, but this is fluorescence intensity as a function of um, cycle number. 
I'll talk a little bit about cycle number, but um, this becomes important as they figure out how much virus you have. So if, you're, if you do have virus, what you'll see is you'll see this curve increase, and then it'll cross this threshold, this dotted line at some cycle number, and that basically tells you how much virus you have. So if you see this go up, then yes, there's virus in there, and if there's no virus, there should be no signal increasing as you go through these cycle numbers, and there's usually 40 when you do PCR. Okay, so a little bit more in depth. So you have your target viral RNA, which is your single stranded RNA. You have primers that will come on and you know tell um, tell you what region of the RNA to amplify for. So you do the reverse transcription, 60 degrees at 30 minutes, and then you turn this into, into DNA, as mentioned. Um, you, you bring it up to 95 degrees, close to boiling for 15 seconds to um, denature the two strands of um, DNA into uh, two strands again. And then you just amplify that way by putting on the primers of these two strands. And then you have the enzyme, oh, sorry. If you swipe up to the right hand corner, does that do it? standard curves, 
We actually did this on the virus that came out of the VSL3 lab, and we found it to be quite high in titers, about 10 to the 8. So that's quite good. That means we're growing an X virus, and we can detect it really well through this qPCR assay. And so this is why I want to bring up um, qPCR. So qPCR is a very, very, very sensitive test. Right, so you are actually, the, the limit of PCR detection is quite low. So here you can see, um, if you were to look at the log of the viral load, and then this is kind of your day since you've been exposed, right? So what happens is, let's say you're exposed, you're exposed at day two. Well, the virus replicates really quickly in your body. So it, it's gonna amplify very quickly. So what this graph is saying is, you know, you have a PCR test that's highly sensitive. The PCR test to measure, if you look here on the left, it measures probably about 10 to the 3 copies per microliter. So that's a thousand copies per milliliter, or I often think about it, about it as like one copy per microliter, right? So it's a thousand microliters per milliliter. So that's a really, really low, low, very sensitive test. But what you'll see a lot now in the news is this need for rapid testing because you know the four hours, the expensive, you know, it's such an expensive test. You need these rapid cheap tests in order to really, you know, if you, to really test everybody and to do surveillance. And you know, if you feel like you were exposed to somebody that has a virus, but you know, you're not sure, then you just want to know. You just want a rapid test. So these rapid tests, um, like the one I'm going to be telling you about that's going on in my lab can measure down to say 10 to the five. And you know, within half a day, you're already at 10 to the five. So basically what this rapid test does is it can measure all of these points at which you're transmissible in the number of days since exposure. And that's, that's exactly what you need. You need to be able to measure kind of here at this curve, whether or not you're, you're infectious. So there's this, this push for this rapid testing that's a lot better than qPCR. And actually, um, these researchers, um, let's see, led by Michael Nina at Harvard and Roy Harper at SMU Boulder, um, have shown that, have modeled that, you know, the sensitivity of your test, whether you have qPCR or you have some sort of other rapid test that maybe is not as sensitive, um, that test sensitivity is not as important compared to testing frequency. And so this paper is talking about testing daily, everyone daily, or everyone every three days, right? And that, that seems to pull out, if you look at this graph here, this is the percent of infectiousness and um, the number of, the percent of infectiousness needs to be removed and how often you test. So if you look here, assuming you have really good contact tracing and then isolation, if you test daily, you know, you have 100% infectiousness removed. If you test every three days, which is recommended, um, that's also pretty good, you know, it's close to 90% with the super sensitive test, the qPCR test. And if you look, this second bar graph, the, the darker one, is the 10 to the 5, the less sensitive test. And you can see really that difference in sensitivity doesn't matter. It's really the frequency at which you test that matters. So that's kind of the latest um, thought right now is, is that we need these rapid frequent tests. So how do you do that? Um, in my lab, we're using a method called isothermal amplification. So we call it, it's called LAMP, Loop Mediated Isothermal Amplification DNA. So you can see here that um, qPCR was invented in 1985. Like I mentioned, I, I walked you all through it. You know, it, it's, it's slow, it's expensive. You need an expensive, that qPCR instrument is expensive. So it's probably about $50,000 for that machine to do it. And you have to do all these temperature cycles, so it takes it takes a while. Well, LAMP has, was invented in 2000 um, by a Japanese group, and the thing about LAMP is that you know it's it really rapidly it has six different primers in there, and it really rapidly amplifies for the RNA to make DNA. So it's really fast. It's very cheap. These baskets are probably like a dollar. Really basic equipment, but all you need. Isothermal means you hold the temperature constant, and all you need is a heat source. So you need an oven, um, a sous vide machine. I read a paper that has that. Um, just hot water. So, so just something that holds it at 65 degrees for half an hour. Okay. Um, so again, it's really fast. Take 30 minutes versus two to four hours for QPCR. 
simple, one temperature, cheap, each assay is about a dollar, whereas like the CDC assay I, talk, I talked about is you know, about $24. And the thing about lab that's nice too is that you know, you're not gonna run out of this, this enzyme, it's very easy to just produce this enzyme, which is nice. Um, it's been used in the past, it's been used for a lot of field diagnostics. So testing for really dangerous viruses like Zika and Ebola and dengue. And um, I guess this is the first time we've ever had to like adapt this assay for massive testing of people. <laughs> so, so there's been a lot of research in the past six months. If you just look at the lamp literature, tons of preprints coming out, and a lot of research on how do you how do you make these lamp tests? Um, how do you put them in devices? How do you put them onto paper? How do you make them run faster? Understanding it better, right? And so. The nice thing I think that what LAMP will offer is a way to really test asymptomatic people. So people who are, you know, there's so much, there's so much work, uh, so much uh, research now that shows a lot of the transmission is happening through asymptomatic people. You don't know you're, you're sick. You can't tell, right? And it's just, you're just spreading this virus around. Um, and so the nice thing is, like I said, it can be field deployable. You don't need, it's not tied to a lab. So you can see here, it's been done at the University of Wisconsin, they're right here testing um, outside of an elementary school in a van. They call it COVID van, COVAN or something like that. And you know, signing consent forms and doing the test right then and there, half an hour. Here, this is Chris Mason, who's a geneticist, and he grew up in Racine, Wisconsin. This is a different area of Wisconsin, but you know, he just brought it over to his, I think his brother's the mayor of this town, and he brought it to the firefighters there. So he's testing people at the firefighter station. And I think that, um, yeah, that's the neat thing about this test, all of these reasons. Okay, so like I mentioned, you need no experienced personnel to do it, um, no expensive equipment, and the neat thing about it is you can see the changes by eye, so it's colorimetric. So if you look here, this is in my lab, um, pink is negative, and what happens is you have, you mix together all these solutions, all, you know, the primers, the enzyme, um, and it, it's actually pink, and it turns yellow when it, when it, it when there's a genomic material in it that's positive. So here you can see it's like I have the RBRP, I believe it's in the middle. I have the E gene of the SARS coronavirus here on the left. It's also yellow, and I put in here also influenza. We did a little bit of work with influenza because that's my what my lab worked on. And um, so it's really easy to see by eye. It's so easy. I I call this the coffee cup paper, even though it's called SARS-CoV-2 on the spot virus detection directly from patients. Um, my really good friend, Asaf here, who I worked with as a postdoc, is on here. So I was chatting with Asaf one night, and he shows me this, this experiment, which is the coffee cup. He's like, this is the coffee cup I use for this publication. So you can see in this coffee cup, there's like just a, a temperature strip, and um, it just says when you have the right amount of water in it at 65 degrees. So it's basically two parts hot water, one part cold water, and you just mix and you do it in a simple coffee cup. And then this, what this paper shows is that you can just take a saliva sample and you can spit. You can actually heat up your spit at, um, or you can let it sit for a while with this thing called Proteinase K. You heat it up to 95 degrees for five minutes to inactivate any virus that's in the saliva. You don't actually have to do this, I think but that makes it safe to handle. You're handling someone else's saliva. And then you take a small portion of that and you put it into the tube. Then you put the tube into the coffee cup and you see if there's a color change. So if it's positive, it's yellow. If it's negative, it's pink. So, oh wait, I forgot to mention this. This is really funny. So if you look at the bottom, maybe you can't read it, but it says, this method is currently under development and research and is not approved for a self usage for COVID validation today. today. So, well, you can see he, he obviously has tested his entire family at home. He was showing me all the results of his family. So you can test yourself at home, um, or you can test yourself on a yacht. So this is Jonathan Rothberg, and he's a serial entrepreneur. Um, he, uh, so he has a yacht here. <laughs> and it says here at the bottom, while quarantining abroad, Aboard his yacht, Rothberg has devoted himself to developing a diagnostic test that is as simple, fast, and as inexpensive as a home pregnancy test. So he's essentially doing lamp on his yacht. 
Um, he's well known for you know starting companies on sequencing. So he started ion torrent, 454 sequencing. That's this is all way before Illumina sequencing. And actually, he co-founded the first one of the first drop-based microfluidic companies, which is my area of research with my postdoc advisor. So that's kind of an interesting connection. That company was called Raindance back in the early 2000s. So yes, you can test yourself on your gut. Um, here's his little assistant um, and their lamp test. You can see it's a, just a simple heater, right? Like I said, all you need is a heat source. Simple tubes. I think this is the actual test that he's trying to sell and develop right here. That's not FDA approved yet. Um, but yeah, there's a whole fascinating article in the Atlantic about him. So take a look at that article if you're interested. And if you read behind the lines, you can see the test isn't working all that well. But I will, I don't know. Okay. So why saliva? Um, well, like I showed you in that video from New England Journal of Medicine, you don't need an uncomfortable swab um, tickling your brain. Um, you don't have coughing or sneezing spreading the virus, so you don't need somebody, a trained personnel to test, to test you. Um, you know, no swab shortages. We don't need Jim to 3D print all those, those swabs, even though he is. Um, and the nice thing is, you know, this has recently been approved by the FDA. So both, so taking di saliva directly, heating up the saliva, and then doing qPCR on that saliva, basically eliminating that one hour RNA attraction step, which is expensive and takes time. But just going directly from heated saliva to measuring the virus using qPCR. Now that this has been FDA approved as of last month, and so you guys have probably heard about this rapid saliva test. Well, it's still not that rapid, right? Still QPCR, still takes two hours. But you know, it's this is the state of what it is now. So, but it's good. It's a step forward. Still, you still make it faster. And so Yale did this. They called it Saliva Direct. They had, they were sponsored by the NBA, and they called it Spit and Swish. And then um, UIUC had it as well. They have a, also an FDA saliva approved test. And you know, they're testing so much. Like, I'm sure you've heard about them in the in the news. Um, but ironically, you know, I have two virus collaborators at Rutgers in Illinois. Both of them sent me, told me all about their saliva testing at the two places. So saliva, I think you'll see, is becoming more popular. And we've also tried it here, which I'll talk about. Um, this came out in the New England Journal of Medicine at the end of August. And it just talk, talked about, you know, the levels of, of virus and saliva is very comparable to, um, and actually a little bit more within the first 10 days is very comparable to nasal pharyngeal swab sampling. So they correlated it, and they actually found that more viral RNA was detected in, in saliva compared to swab when they did this um, correlation from swab to saliva. And then they compared, you know, days since COVID-19 diagnosis, and they found that a higher percentage of saliva samples, um, of saliva, a higher percentage of saliva samples compared to nasal pharyngeal swab samples were positive up to 10 days after the Diagnosis. So, well, so saliva is is good. So we tried it in our lab, and I said, please give me a saliva sample. And um, we took a pooled saliva sample from presumed healthy individuals, right? So just to make sure you have a good saliva background. And what I had here was everyone spit very safely six feet apart <laughs> um, into a one mil tube um, using kind of just a little pipette tip that we typically use in the lab. So everyone spit. We took the pooled saliva, mixed it with this chemical called protonase A. And that, the thing about saliva is there are so many enzymes in your saliva. So what protonase A does, it breaks down all of the RNAs and DNAs that might, um, that might affect um, accessing the RNA of the virus. So we combine that and we mix it. We heat and activate it for five minutes at 95 degrees. And then we take a small sample of that, put it into our lab mix, and just stick it into an oven for 65 degrees at 30 minutes. So very simple. And this is basically the first part of Saliva Direct, if you look here. This is Saliva Direct, and then this is where we do the lamp. So like I said, it's a rapid, simple colorimetric test. You can see the results by eye. Here you have um, the test, and it's pink, right? That's before we started. And then afterwards, we, we did all of these tests. Well, I'll tell you all about them. but. Um, you can see these yellow tubes, which means it's positive. 
What we did here is like no one was positive, but we spiked in virus, we spiked in RNA. So these are the results of our study. So if you take a look here, um, we basically spiked in, like I said, extracted RNA from the DSL-3 laboratory, and we also took um, heat inactivated virus that came out of the DSL-3 laboratory. And what you can see here is I'll tell you about what these columns mean. So the leftmost column is no template control, it's just water. So we expect that to stay pink, right? So they're all pink, which is great, because there's no viral template in there. Now the second column is a positive control. So I purposely put in there an NG, and they should all be yellow. So they're all yellow, which is great. The third column tests if you're human or not, similar to the, um, the other gene I was telling you about in the CDC assay. Well, this one tests for R actin. And you can see here, all of these bottom samples are saliva in the background, and all of these top samples are water. So you would expect all the saliva samples to be yellow, right? Which they are, so that's good. Now, in water, um, what happens is that you, you expect this to be yellow because you don't really have a, a human sample from here because what this is is an extracted, um, it's just, we put in here the extracted RNA from the BSL-3. So that should actually be all pink. But what's happening is it's half pink, half yellow. And what that means is my tooth weren't very clean. So there's just like human cells everywhere in my lab. Um, and I didn't autoclave my tooth, which meant to sterilize them, so that's why. But that's okay, it doesn't matter for this particular test. And finally, the last column tells you whether or not you're infected. So this is important. This is the SARS-CoV-2. It has primers for both the N and the E gene. So now if these are positive, then that means you have the virus. So if you take a look here, in all of the extracted viruses, um, extracted RNA from 10 to the 7 copies per microliter down to 10 to the 2 copies per microliter, it's actually positive. And if you look here in saliva, what happens is saliva is much harder to amplify in, so at the lowest level it still stays pink. So this is 100 copies per microliter. So that tends, tends to be the limit of detection here for saliva. Um, is about 100 copies per microliter. So it doesn't go all the way down to one with that special trick. So this is not on its own. Okay, but like Jan said, it's good enough, right? So my lab, my, as I showed you, the lab test detects right here. Um, this is this is the 10 to the 10 to the five. It does 10 to the five really well. It didn't do 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the three, or 10 to the two, right? So it didn't go all the way down here below even qPCR. That's okay though. You know, if it's detecting here at 10 to the 5, it's really good enough to detect all of the transmissible viruses. So it's great. So that's why LAMP is such a, um, um, that's why there's been so much progress recently on LAMP research, is because it's so promising, right? It's, it's sensitive or it's specific, it's getting more and more sensitive with research. And um, these are all ways that we can use LAMP. So here you see it's the LAMP reaction. I told you about the tube one. This is the tube method where we looked at the cane color. Um, you can actually put the assay onto the lateral flow assay and look at the color change on kind of a pregnancy strip-like device. Um, that's also the same thing here. Um, you can do it on paper, which is really cheap and great for third world countries, or if you're you know, trying to test um, really cheaply, you can do it on paper. And finally, if you want like a little bit more sensitivity, what you can do is you can put this assay on a lab on a chip. And this is my area of research. So this is kind of what really prompted me to start studying LAMP, is the ability to put LAMP into microfluidics. So what is microfluidics? Well, it's a lab on a chip. And usually I bring a chip for you all to hold, but because I don't want, <laughs> want transfer of uh, virus on a chip, um, I'm not going to pass this chip around, but it's a chip that fits in the palm of your hand. So it's called um, lab on a chip. And basically, you miniaturize everything that you do in the lab into these channels, these tiny channels that are on the chip. And you manipulate small amounts of fluid from like picoliter to nanometer scale inside these channels on the chip. And so it makes it a lot more sensitive because you're uh, a lot more sensitive and specific because. A lot of times we've like really isolated the virus in small volumes. It's called digital PCR. And we don't have a lot of this um, background bulk amplification that's kind of unspecific. So specific and sensitive is fast. You use really small volumes. 
this, this paper came on left, came out recently from BYDC. That's a microfluidic chip that does a lamp. A paper microfluidics was pioneered by George Whiteside at Harvard for many, many years. Um, and Steve Coit here actually pioneered this particular chip that uses pumps and valves. And this chip became Fluidine. This is a company was commercialized into a company called Fluidine. And Fluidine is out now has something on the market that does a, a rapid uh, microfluidic saliva test for COVID. So it's kind of neat to see like this first chip that came out in like early 2000 and how that's changed into something commercialized. So my research is in droplets microfluidics, like I mentioned. Um, and like I said, Jonathan Rothberg had you know, taken this and turned it into a company. Um, but what we do in my lab routinely is we make drops of water and oil. Now this is really fast. We're making this at like a thousandth of a second. So we have a high speed camera that we do. We take a really short video and we slow it down to see the fluid dynamics on chip. And here you can see there are single cells being encapsulated in these drops. And what we do is we put biological samples in here all the time. So we have, you know, viruses that have both DNA and RNA, proteins, cells, all sorts of biological entities at a single cell level, actually. And you can think of them as really, really, really tiny picoliter test tubes. So very small. They're probably like the width of a hair, 100 microns in diameter. Here you can see yeast cells that are being encapsulated. Here you collect them all in a tiny tube, and that's just a million drops in that tiny tube. And then you can re you can incubate that tiny tube, and then you can re-inject them into another microfluidic device here. Um, you can, what we call fecal inject, you can add a small amount of liquid to each one of these drops as it's passing by these electrodes. Um, you can do the opposite. You can pull off a small section of a drop from a bigger drop, so there's a huge slug. And you take a tiny drop, 1% of the drop being pulled away. Um, and finally, we have this really unique ability to sort. So we have this custom-built optics microscope. It's kind of high-tech, but we, what we do is we can sort out drops that are fluorescent to drops that are bright, or drops that are dim. And what we can do, what we routinely do in my lab, is we do what's called quantitative PCR, but at the droplet level. So it's everything that I told you about with qPCR, but we've miniaturized it to a tiny, tiny, tiny volume. So here on the left, you can see the bulk PCR curves like I was showing you. I see amplification curves where, you know, to the left, we have higher amounts of RNA. To the right, we have lower amounts of RNA. We can do the same thing in drops, and they look like this when you actually image them. So I mentioned the rocks reference guide. Well, that's always going to be the same color, but if you look, at the green, which is the fan probe, these drops here from this red curve have 10 to the 4 copies per drop. That's 10,000 copies of virus in one of these drops. And here we have 10 to the minus 1 copies per drop. So one in every 10 of these drops has a single virus. Um, and so that's how we can be really quantitative um, and look at viruses at really small you know, drops. It's really rapid. Um, and so here you can see we just um, working on this paper that um, should be coming out pretty soon, but um, we can detect down to a single variant in a drop just by looking at the fluorescence of these drops. And we have this fancy um, optics microscope that I told you about, the high-speed uh, fluorescence camera. Um, and we can really quantify the numbers that are in the drop. And so when the pandemic happened, I thought, all right, well, we can do digital droplet PCR, right, um, very easily. So I thought, well, let's just try the lamp in drops. So this is what we've recently been working on for the past few months. Um, it's called, it's a way of doing digital drop lamp. So we just put the lamp amplification in drops. And we call it the freedom chip. So here is a prototype of the freedom chip. Um, I called it the freedom chip because I don't know about you guys, but it was like being cooped up during the beginning of the pandemic. I was like, <laughs> so I call it the freedom chip. It's still called the freedom chip. But it's a cheap disposable rapid point of care of microfluidic device that does lamp and drops. So this prototype here. Um, and this is what I wanted freedom to do. So freedom to get together, um, to you know, work, see friends and family, to travel, um, freedom from infection. So um, I just wanted us to all be able to go to a football game again and go see Tim McGraw 
at the Brookfield <laughs> Brook Freedom Field House and, you know, do all the things that we normally do. So the question is, can we be safe? Well, for our SARS-1, it was really easy to do massive surveillance, right? Because with SARS-1, it was really um, genetically similar to SARS-2, which is what this is, a, this essentially is SARS-2. Um, with SARS-1, you could actually just measure somebody's temperature, and you can you could see if somebody was infected because they could have a fever. Well, it doesn't work for this particular virus, even though I think people still check temperatures. Maybe it's like a placebo effect, but you know, it doesn't work for this particular virus. You actually have to figure out, well, you actually have to test the virus, right? Do some rapid test, lamp, keep PCR, there's these rapid antigen tests that are coming out on the market now, these paper strips, but they're really not that sensitive, but still better than nothing. Um, so we need something that's really fast, simple, easy, and effective. And, effective. and so the concept is, like I said, we're gonna use saliva, because it's really non-invasive. Um, the idea is to do like digital drop lamp. Um, and use these drops. So this is the idea of the freedom drug. So you have, you know, the chip that can fit in the palm of your hand inside of a sterile bag with a tube. You'll spit into the tube, you'll put the tube on the chip, everything that you need is onboarded onto the chip, and then you'll heat, you'll heat the chip up, right, for, for 30 minutes, or actually, the weird thing about drops is that because your volumes are so small, it's a lot faster. So it's not going to take 30 minutes because the reaction happens in a small volume and it happens a lot faster that way. So we think it's probably somewhere between like five and 10 minutes. And then you can read it out if they have cell phones. So that's the idea, and I compared it to some of the most, um, some of the point of care devices, rapid point of care devices that are out on the market now that would be competitors. There's not very many, because I think no one has ever had to test so many people so quickly. <laughs> So the, the things that are out there are, are um, Expert Express, which is um, qPCR, but it's also miniaturized. Um, and then the ID Now, which is another isothermal method of exfiltration. The problem with these is that they're difficult, they're expensive, they're hard to get hold of. Like when we call these companies, you know, they, they, weren't even, they couldn't make enough. And so that's the thing is I think we'll be seeing more and more new rapid um, testing methodologies out. In, in the next few months, including hopefully the freedom chip. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll show you how. Uh, so we have, have in my, this is some preliminary results from my lab. We've been able to amplify for both the RBRP and E. I showed you the QPCI data. Well, this is the lamp data. And the interesting thing is here, what you can see about the lamp data is that you know you have amplification here within five minutes. So if you have a ton of virus in there, I'll know within five minutes. And this is the bulk, this isn't even the drops yet. So bulk, I can see amplification in five minutes, and then at most, you know, the takeoff happens after 20 minutes. So it is really rapid. I mean, yes, you wait half an hour to make sure that the reaction is complete, but I think in drops, this is gonna be a lot faster. It's really sensitive, so the difference between color, so colorimetric goes down to 100 copies per microliter. But this is a flexed version of lamp, which is more sensitive, and you can see here from our data, it goes down to four copies per microliter, which is actually really sensitive. Um, we've done it also with extracted genomic RNA from the BSL-3, so that also works really well. And we've done it also with influenza. So one of my um, dreams is to be able to have one chip that can test you for both influenza and SARS-CoV-2, which would be amazing. Um, here is just a proof of concept to show that it works. So um, we put in here you know, 400 copies per mil, and so not all the drops will be bright. So the drops that are bright, here have um, the virus in it, so we're looking at the RBRP gene. So proof of concept is working. Now, now we have to design the chip and you know the reader, the the readout box, get an app going for a cell phone to um, communicate the results. So there's a lot of engineering that goes along here, but at least the app is working. And so that's all. Yeah, that's all I have today. Um, this is my lab, um, my funding agency, my lab. Um, and um, feel free to follow me on Twitter at the Screen Lab or email me. Um, and yeah, you guys are, I feel like we're so lucky, right, in the middle of the pandemic to be here in this like beautiful place surrounded by mountains where we can like float to ski and do all these wonderful outdoor activities. So I feel like this is a great place to be in the middle of the pandemic. All right.
Well, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Yes, absolutely. So that's one of the things that I didn't know anything about as a basic scientist, but I'm learning more about in terms of how do you get clinical diagnostics out to market. It's really important to have this um, to be approved by the FDA. And um, the FDA has what's called an emergency use authorization. And for a lot of these companies, what they do is they have to, you know, they have to, they have to be able to sell the device, they have to have this authorization. And so you know, the bar has been changing as to, it used in the beginning of the pandemic, it was really high as to what needed to be, you know, what the sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, all, cross-reactivity, all these things that go into like clinical tests had to be, in the beginning of the pandemic, it was quite high, the bar was quite high. But now because there's such an urgent need for rapid testing and more testing, that bar has slowly, slowly, but very little, come down a little bit. So I think, I think we're gonna see in the course of this pandemic, the regulatory start to change even more depending on how everything evolves. But it's really important for a company to get it. So yes, we'll have to, we'll have to get it. So to get it, you need to um, test with verified samples. And that's the thing, you need to test, you know, test with verified dirty positive samples and dirty negative samples to make sure your assay is also starting over. Um, you showed that you're using this Pac-Man um, in the beginning. Are you sticking with Pac-Man or are you switching to a, a cheaper? No, nope, Pac-Man is the expensive one. That's PPPR. Yeah. Yes, and that is the pro. That's the one that's you know twenty-five dollars a, a mm -hmm. test. That's easy assay, and ours is a dollar, right? For like the lamp assay. Which okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a different enzyme. So Tac uses um, Tac chlorine. Oh, guys, this is super cool. You guys are so lucky to be here. So Tac Chlorine was discovered in Yellowstone by Montana State researchers. This is so cool. So I went sampling with Brent Payton in my department, and he took me to the spring where it was isolated and, um, and found, and I made, I made 7630 <laughs> hot spring there. I was like, I'm here where Tac Chlorine was discovered. Um, but yeah, so Tac, tac is the enzyme. It came from here, which is so cool. and. Um, the enzyme that's used in the lamp is called DSP. Okay. It's a little bit different. It's sold by New England Bio Labs. They make a lot of it. There, and actually, you know, people are just really into helping. So there's a group, several groups out there are trying to make these open source enzymes where you can, they'll give you the formulation of how to make it in your lab. You can make a ton of it. And it's similar, it's a similar, similar to DSP, similar to it does lamp. And then it's measuring fluorescence, right? So it's exciting with the laser, and then if there's something fluorescent in your drop, it emits a light source that goes back into your microscope and is detected through a series of PMTs, photomultiplier tubes. The photomultiplier tubes are really sensitive. They can detect down to a single photon. And then what happens is like, all right, the PMTs are connected um, into like a high voltage amplifier that's then connected to a computer that's running this entire program on lab view. And then what LabVIEW does is it, it says, all right, your signal is positive, we want that drop. And then it, it feeds back, like it does a feedback loop um, to turn on this high voltage amplifier, which then turns on the electrodes that you have built into your chip, which then pulls the drop out. It pulls the drop out through like an electric field, basically, really quickly. So it all happens in like microseconds. Well, like I said, 
in the QPCR test and the TACMEN test, he had that probe, and I didn't explain that really well, but he had that FAM probe, that Flex's probe. So every time it goes from like DNA, you know, you, and you, you raise the temperature, it splits into two, and then you, you make another double strand, so it's two of them, and it exponentially amplifies. Every time you make a strand of DNA, one fluorophore is released. So as that's happening, you can watch in real time, that's what the QPCR means, like quantitative PCR, real time PCR. You can watch it like amplify over time. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a probe reaction that every time you get a strand of DNA, um, it starts to, it, it, it's, you know, released. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, everyone uses it, so I, I think most, most um, campuses will have a QPCR machine. It's very, very common in biology. Are there any more questions? No? Well, thank you all for coming. Please thank the wonderful Dr. Connie Chang. <laughs>